continue. So hello and good morning to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Ultima Business Solutions. Thank you all for joining and for giving me around 45 minutes to an hour of your time to discuss Microsoft Teams. More specifically, I'm going to be talking about how to enhance flexible working and uh, collaboration with Microsoft Teams. So I guess first to establish some context around the current climate. I'm sure we're all in agreement that the current climate has presented many, many challenges to many organizations and we're all now being required to work remotely, perhaps before we were ready to do so, um, which has presented many challenges. For me personally, it's, uh, it's always been a challenge keeping out of the fridge, but the primary challenges really are how to remain productive and, uh, and to how to collaborate with my colleagues and my teams when the workforce is now divided. Now I've worked as a consultant for around seven or eight years, so I'm, I'm used to remote working and, and flexible working, but I know many of the clients that I work with are, are, have struggled to adjust to it initially, but in the long term, they do find it quite, quite easy and quite productive way of working. And Microsoft Teams is a fantastic tool to aid with the collaboration and flexibility and can certainly enhance that. But it's not just for remote working, it's actually very, very useful for, for businesses that have offices and, and remote staff as well. So it's not just a stopgap to, to address the, the current climate. It's also, I think, a very, very long-term solution as well and can certainly bring businesses together that are disparate and are unspread around. So it will address the challenges you have on remaining productive and collaborating when a workforce is split. And I say there are huge benefits, for, I think, for the long term as well. So the agenda I'm going to run through today, I'm going to give a brief introduction to myself. I'm then going to talk about some of the, the trial offers that Microsoft currently have. I think it's useful to bring that up at this point because I'm going to make some assumptions about the, the audience I have. It's quite a large audience, but I'm, I'm going to feel that you probably fall into one of three different buckets. So the first bucket, and I do recognize some of the names of people that are attending. I think you are already using Teams. You've used it for some time or you're just starting out with Teams. So you have some experience, but perhaps you're looking to to gain some, some best practice guidelines on some, some more efficient ways of working. Then there's a second bucket that perhaps you do have some cloud technology or some cloud presence and you're considering using Teams and you want to know about uh, what the benefits of this platform and how can we improve collaboration for you. And then perhaps the third bucket is you have never used Teams, you don't have any cloud services whatsoever and perhaps your remote users are now currently still using a, a traditional VPN to access all of your content services. So you want to know, is it worth investing? Is it worth considering moving to cloud? So I will talk about the trials that Microsoft currently have, which is more applicable to perhaps the second and third buckets than the first, because you really have a, a tenant in play. But it's still worth mentioning that there are trials available out there. Again, because of the three buckets of people I'm going to be talking to potentially, I'm going to review the interface and go over the different elements of the interface that make up the team's client. And then the bulk of today's webinar is really around the, uh, how you can use the interface to, to improve collaboration. So I'll go through mostly the, the tips and tricks and a lot of, of demos in, in a, a development environment I've got without boring you to death with uh, lots of PowerPoint slides. And then finally, at the end, I'll talk about well, how Ultima, Ultima can help you. So what can we do to help you? If you're in any three of those groups I described at the beginning, can we help you to enhance your team's experience? Can we help you take the step into Teams for the first time? Or perhaps we can help you to move into cloud for the first time. How can we help you? So at the end, I'll pass some, some, uh, some uh, information on how you can contact us and how we can contact you. And uh, we have sales, sales teams are standing by ready to help if we can. So first, a little bit about myself. My name is Lee Drinkwater. My current role within Ultima is I'm a team lead for the intelligent automation practice within Ultima, but my primary area of skill is around SharePoint. I've been a consultant for say, seven or eight years since 2013. I, uh, my subject area of expertise is with uh, SharePoint migration and uh, the Power Platform, and uh, I guess 365 in, in general. I've been working with Microsoft Teams for about two or three years. I've been working remotely for about seven or eight years and, and and traveling around and I do find that the combination of 365 and Microsoft Teams are a very, very useful tool in my tool set to help me keep in touch with my colleagues but now as a team lead to help me to collaborate and coordinate with my, my team as well. That's a bit about myself. So before I talk about the trial license, I want to talk about the purpose of Microsoft Teams. So 
many people describe teams in many different ways, but I think at its core, that the main purpose or, or the purpose Mark's trying to portray is that it's a unified communication and collaboration platform. And it consolidates a very large number of different tools into a single platform that can help you to become more efficient and more, more productive. How to do that? Well, I think one of the key ones is it reduces email noise, depending on how your business is run or how you communicate. If you don't use Teams, perhaps you still use email. Email is still the primary means of communication and it can get very, very noisy. So, and combine that with the, with the advent of what they call context switching. So if you have many, many applications on your, on your client machines, if you're using a line of business application in the browser and you're using your email and you're using a Word or Excel client or PowerPoint slide or a number of different applications, you're constantly switching between a number of different places that can be seen as inefficient. Where there's a huge benefit with Microsoft Teams is it can bring all of those into a single interface, into a single client application, which is available on any device at any time from a device with internet connection. That's one of the huge benefits. As it's communication based, it's certainly more, more modern in the modern world, and it can certainly limit the uh, amount of email noise you potentially can generate. But how does it do that? Well, we'll look at the interface in a second. Before I go any further, I want to talk about the trial licenses that are on offer. So there are there are many options available, but there are, I think there are two primary examples of good trial off offerings at the moment that do have two very different use case scenarios. The first is on the right-hand side, and this is probably only applicable for what well, is only applicable for the group, the third group I described in that it's completely free, has unlimited number of users with no expiration, but it's only for customers that have no prior cloud environments and no Azure Active Directory, no Azure elements of any kind. That is available to you. It's completely free, as I say. You can register for it and you can use it for any number of users, but you can't, you can't then upgrade that into a fully fledged solution. I believe you can. If you choose to purchase later on, you can migrate the content out of there, but it's very much a sandbox environment to allow you to play around with Teams and to get used to the interface and, and that way of working. So arguably a very, very small use case scenario. The better option is, is the option on the left, is that there is a, a full free Office 365 E1 trial available that is fully fledged, uh, has a limit of 3,000 users, a duration and expiry of six months, and is available via the Microsoft partner and the cloud service provider network to which Ultima are a member. So we can help you with this. It cannot replace a paid subscription. So if you are currently a, a paid subscription or paid subscriber to Microsoft, you can't arrange one of these trials in order to avoid paying for six months. It doesn't work that way. It's only for new businesses. So arguably the second and the third bucket I described a minute ago, you would fall into that category. It is fully fledged, so you could establish this trial. You could connect it to your on-premise environment to synchronize identities and get a, a real idea of how it may work for you and how you could enhance uh, Office 365 and cloud going forward. So there are, there are two very different offerings. I think the better is, is, the, is the item on the left, certainly for anyone in, in the second or third bucket. We talked about the purpose. I think um, one of the... <laughs> One of the areas we can always improve is we can probably have less meetings, but it depends. Teams is very much a communication-based platform and meetings are a very big part of that. The longer you work in IT, you realize there's always a deal book for every situation, but it's not always about more meetings, but it's about efficiency and about being more productive. So Teams is not about having more meetings, although you certainly can conduct your meetings through Teams, which I will go through shortly. But we're looking at the, the actual walkthrough of the, of the platform and the interface and then sort of how you can enhance your collaboration going forward. So I'm going to do an a review of the interface and then follow up with a number of different areas around the interface of how I think collaboration can be improved. So I'm going to be switching back and forth between my, my screens. So please bear with me for a second, please. Okay. So there are largely two, there are two options available for the client application. I say client application, there's one client application available for Windows and there's another for, for the mobile devices, iOS and Android. They all have the same feature set. They are, are they do have feature parity, but there is also a web-based client as well. So for the purpose of this demo, I am going to be showing you the client application, which you can see on screen, but I will also be using the web-based client as well, just for ease of use, because I'm going to be switching between a couple of different profiles. There are some limitations with the web-based client, which I will bring up 
as they, as they come across them. But largely speaking, feature parity is achieved between the two. I'm just showing you the client application here initially, just so you get an idea of some of the subtle differences. So this is the client application on a Windows 10 machine, and it has a fairly, fairly uh, easy interface to navigate. I'm using the, the standard look and feel, but you can change the color scheme if you prefer. Now the screen is divided into, into four or five different areas. And again, this is just to establish some context. So I, when I bring these up later on, we all are on the same page. So on the far left hand side, we have the navigation pane. So this is the dark blue area. This allows us to navigate around the different elements of the team's client. Now there is an ellipsis here as well, which allows us to add additional apps to this navigation pane. If they are added at this point, it means they're available to me inside my client's application, but I haven't published them into a, to a team or a channel or available for anyone else's use at that point. It's worth making that point at this point in that if I add one here, it's available for me only. So if I add Planner, for example, into the tab here, it's available for me. I can then configure Planner within the context of my client application in order to get to that app. But for all intents and purposes, the default you get are the five that you see here. And this is a navigation pane. Now, if you click on a different area of the navigation pane, the information inside the navigation area, which is the first area on the left in white, will also change. This area in white here is the navigation area, and it will change depending on what you select. Now, when you select an item inside the navigation area, the information on the right-hand side in the gray box, which is the workspace, will then change depending on the context. So I'm looking at the activity feed at the moment. If I have two items here, if I change them here, the pane will change on the right-hand side. To reflect whatever I've selected. Those are the three main working areas and the two additional ones which I guess are more auxiliary is the, the client settings menu. I can't think of a better way to describe this but here you can do some small administration on your user account, change a picture and, and access your, your profile for Delve. From here you can set your availability status, you can set a message and you can look at your saved message which I will cover in a bit more depth later on. But primarily this, this menu is used for how the app is being presented to you at this point. So you can change some of the background settings in here. So you can change the color scheme, your privacy notifications, the device you've got attached to it and your, and your core settings are all done through here. Um, and then the final area is the, the command bar. It's sometimes referred to as a search bar, I prefer to call it the command bar. Here you can conduct searches and you can issue commands. So I can search for a particular item and if I hit enter, my typing. The information changed inside the navigation area will reflect what I searched and it will give me three verticals by default. So it has searched for that term inside a uh, number of messages. I can look for people as well. It didn't find any matches and I can look at files. I'll go into files in a lot more depth later on, but it's worth noting that any file that's displayed here will be inside any of the teams to which you're a member or an owner. So search really should be the first place you start. Certainly if you start to roll out teams in a very large environment, teams can become not messy is the wrong word. It, it can create a lot of noise if it's not done in, in, a, in a tidy way. So making search your friend, I think, is a, is a very good strategy. The command bar also accepts commands, hence the name of the command. So there is a, a, a cache of the ones I've really recently entered. But if you put a forward slash in, you can get a full readout of all the commands that you can, can issue. I will go through these in more depth as I move around the tool, but there are a couple of, of key ones in here. What's new is always worth Noting, spell it right. This will show you the release notes for the client. So depending on if you're an existing Teams client or, or 365 subscriber, depending on the, the rate at which you receive updates from Microsoft, you may receive them straight away or you may, may receive them on a delayed schedule. You will get updates and you will get release notes in here. It's always worth being aware of what's changed and when it's changed, how it may affect you. Certainly if you're in a technical department and you're managing a help desk, if this has changed overnight and suddenly all your users are now using a different version where they're in a subtle change, it's good to get an idea of what's changed so that when the tickets start coming in, you can issue either a knowledge base article or start to, to mitigate some of those tickets as they come in. So it's quite useful to keep on top of what's changing within Microsoft Teams. The roadmap itself is also available online as well. But uh, I generally wait until the items actually appeared in Teams before I look at them any, any depth. A lot of items appear on the roadmap and disappear and never actually find their way into the tool. So that's a whistle stop tour of the interface. I'm now going to move around and use some of the areas in a lot more depth. 
So Teams at its heart is a communication-based platform. And so chat and conversing is really at its heart. So the first thing I'm going to talk about really is, is chat, is that chats are based on Skype technology. It's part of the team suite and can be either a one-to-one -one or one-to-many relationship. They are persistent, which is a word that's worth remembering. And the reason that's important is that if you go back to using traditional email, if you have a large team and you send emails around to a large number of the members of the team asking for their input, unless everyone responds to the last message in the conversation, it's possible the conversation will end up with several branches. So if you want to bring somebody in at the end of that conversation, it's very difficult to be able to hand over exactly what's occurred within that conversation unless you happen to have had all the responses. It does happen, but a lot of times it, it generally doesn't. Where persistent chat is a real benefit is that if I have a chat here between myself and, and Arthur, if I choose to add somebody in and bring somebody in, if I was to bring in Anne, again, type her name properly, but if I join her in, she'll get a notification she's been joined straight away and she'll be able to see all of the previous conversation elements that we've shared up until that point. If she was to be to leave the chat or was to be removed from the chat, she'll still be able to review the the history of that chat but it does remain persistent so if she then gets joined in later on she'll see that entire chat history which i think is a huge benefit chats can be one-to-one -one or one-to-many as i said before and the interface is fairly similar between a chat and a conversation which i will go through shortly but there are some um, filter items you can apply here as well so if you have a very busy chat interface you can apply filtering here and you can use keywords to, to, to filter so if i'm looking for a particular chat against a single person, I could search for the name or search for a particular term I was chatting about. Bad example, it's not showing any responses. But the, the filter does work through here. The better way to search is using the command bar, but certainly you can do some, some filtering there. And you can also look at your contacts that are associated with your chat as well through here. Now, the chat interface is very similar to the conversation element of the team, which I'll show in a second, but there are some subtle differences. But inside the chat down here, you can apply some formatting. Um, these are all fairly uh, common, but they once used uh, a rich text editor before. One key one I like to, to show is the, um, it's the code snippet. So I share a lot of PowerShell scripts and various code elements with some of my team. This is very useful for anyone that works in that industry as well, is that if you change the language that you're using, and then copy or paste in some code, it will read the, the code based on the, the, the language you've selected and it will color code it accordingly. And I can then insert it into the chat and, and post it, which is quite useful. Um, other than that, it's a, it's a fairly standard rich text editor. There are some additional flags you can associate with this as well. So you can uh, in, indicate the importance of a message. Okay, the sandwich bands outside is always a good one. Where things are urgent, I would urge you not to use this all the time because people start to ignore it. But it is a useful one if it is actually an urgent item. Although I'd argue if it's that urgent, you probably should pick up the phone or make a call using, uh, using Teams. But it, it does have that ability available to you. Where attachments come in, I think it's another huge benefit over email, is that you can upload an attachment into this chat from your machine or from, from FileShare if you want to, and it will actually add it into your OneDrive. Or you can share an item that's already in your OneDrive through this persistent chat. Well, that's a huge benefit, again, if you're used to communicating over email traditionally, is that if you share a single file or, or you email a single file to five or six people and you ask for their input, they're probably going to edit the one they've got. They now have a different version when you have. They're going to send it back. You're now going to have six or seven versions to go through to play into the version you had originally. Or perhaps you were, you were more clever at the beginning and you actually shared a link to it from your file share. That's a, that's a benefit because you actually have a link rather than a, a persistent file. But the problem is that the file share may not allow you to all edit at the same time. So the first person that gets in, maybe the second might be able to edit at the same time, but then it's going to lock the file and the file will not allow additional edits. So you're still going to have a problem where it may not be the most up-to-date element of truth, in which case you see many examples and many of the clients that we work with, you'll see persistent duplication. So people will create additional copies, you know, file, final, 2017, 2019, final. Uh, pen their own names at the end, you'll get a lot of duplication for that reason. So I think this is a huge benefit here. Share the file within the chat, you can then start conversing. Where this is of a huge benefit is if I go back to chats I had before. 
is that if I go to a persistent chat, and again, persistent is a, key, is a key word here. The last message I sent to Anne here was back in September last year, but it has kept the conversation, including what I sent yesterday and today. The file is still there and I can actually view it through the tab or I can click on the file itself. So any files that we share between ourselves will be in, held within this tab. And this is just a representation of where the files are elsewhere, but it brings them all together in a nice, easy way. It saves me having to go and find it, search around inside the various teams and try to find where that file is. It does bring it together in a single place. Again, making it slightly more efficient than having to dive around into multiple places. There is an additional organization tab here as well. So it does allow me to see the relationship between myself and the person I'm chatting with. And then a sort of a log of the activity as well. I, don't, I largely don't use these uh, very often, but they are a nice to have, I suppose. And I will go into more depth later on, but you can add additional tab and additional functionality into this chat here as well. That's with the sharing of files. There are some additional ones as well. Um, this is worth showing for the, um, the show the, the customization side of Teams as well. So Teams is a very, a very um, useful client and lots of brings together lots of different external apps and different uh, uh, applications. But you can also do a, a quite a high level of, of customization of your own. Anyone that's interested in development. So a good example of this is the um, the weather app. It's already there. If I put in a location and add it to the tab, it's going to bring up what they call an adaptive card. So this is a big area of functionality around Teams. And you can build an app that does a similar function within your particular business. And adaptive cards is an area I would, I would highly recommend you, you investigate. It can be created as an app and uploaded into your Teams client, available for everyone across the entire business, and can be visible either as a chat item or as a conversation element within your team. It's just to give you an example of what is possible. I'm going to discard this. That generally chat. There are, there are three ways of creating a chat. You can do a new chat window from up here, start chatting away when you're putting the person you want to write to. You can also use the command bar. So again, I'm using forward slash chat. You press the tab, it then asks you which person you want to write to. It does help with tab completion and you can say, um, Just uh, bring that message to Anne. But that will only appear, it's a one-to-one -one relationship again, so I can't send a message through this command bar to a chat that has multiple recipients. It can only be a one-to-one, -one, but it is a useful, fast way of sending a message. What you'll see is it, it actually has appended it to the persistent chat I had already with Anne. So there's a new mention here, the new message that I sent. And if I switch over to Anne's, Teams in the face, bear with me. So she'll see there's an alert telling her there's a new chat. So she's part of one group that's got herself and Arthur and myself. And there's also an additional chat here, the message that Lee just sent to her. So I'm now going to stay with the web client because it's a lot easier when I'm switching backwards and forwards. I'm looking at the activity plan, and this is similar to your inbox inside email so the first place you probably come to in the, in the morning when you start coming to your, your activity feed to have a look at what needs to be looked at today and again this is all reliant on the proper etiquette being followed i suppose and this is certainly an area that ultimately can can assist with but um, if we use the email analogy as well as a good way of describing it is that with traditional email if you put a person's name into the two box you're generally saying that i'm sending it to you i'm asking or expecting a response from you because I put you in the two box. If their name or address is in the CC box, it's for their information, but I'm not expecting a response. They can respond, but I'm not expecting one. Now, that being said, we do see scenarios where you are writing to someone for their information and you put them in the two box. It's not a, a clear black and white area, but it, it is general etiquette that uh, I think should be, should, be, should be followed. And with the Teams, it's very similar. If you're chatting one-to-one, -one, it's a one-to-one -one chat, or one-to-one, -one, or one-to-many, sorry. The messages are generally expected to be between all the parties involved and they are all accepting they are in the two box. When you have teams and conversations, which I'm going to go through in a second, that can sometimes get lost. Anyone that's used WhatsApp will know if you're part of a, a group that's got a lot, large number of members, 
step away for a day, come back, there's 300 messages, it gets very, very noisy. I highly recommend that if you do want to have chats with individual people outside of a team, or outside of a conversation, that you have those in the private chat, and not inside the conversation area, because it will add to the noise. But the point I raised here is that using the app mention feature in Teams is how you draw someone's attention to something. So here I can see, I'm logged in as Anne, and can see that there was a reply from Arthur on one thing. Lee mentioned me and, and two two items that Lee mentioned directly and on, on a couple of items. If I select them, it will then change the items over on the panel here. And I can see it's highlighted here in the red which item Anne was being called out on. Anne can then respond in line if she wants to and, and proceed from there. But the feed also has a, a filter as well. So I can use a text filter to put in particular items of text, which does filter as you can see. But a useful addition here is that you can then choose which item or which type of item you want to filter on if, uh, if you happen to have a very busy activity feed. Now that can become busier once you become members of one more teams, so it's very common for that to occur. Again, the, if I move to a team, make it easier. The command bar also has some commands you can use against that. So unread will apply the same filter to show me anything that's unread. This is probably a good place to start in the morning when you first start work is to have a look at what's what requires your attention you can then respond straight away you can deal with those items and you can see what else has been, been going on you can also look at uh, forward slash mentions see if you've mentioned or anything as well so there's a couple of useful shortcuts that are quite quite useful at uh, saving some time where these become i think more prevalent is when you have a very busy environment with lots and lots of teams so that's largely it for the, the chat function mainly because uh, there are big, bigger areas that I think need more, more attention. Looking at the Teams area, and I think this is where you'll probably spend most of your time within the Teams client, and this is then potentially quite big. So every team inside Microsoft Teams generally should have a purpose. The purpose of that team would have been hopefully agreed before it was created. And within the team, you have owners and members who are part of that team. And all that really means is you have a different level of access. But in that team, you then have what are called channels. So channels, again, using the, the email analogy, should be thought of as, as like the subject line in an email. So what information is inside that channel? What, what do I want to talk about inside that channel? And that's what the channel should be named for. So when you build a team, you get a general channel out of the box. My personal opinion is the general channel really should be removed, mainly because, again, my background being the SharePoint and, and Sort of document management solutions if you have a generalized category generally forgive the pun means that your categorization has failed because there is no general category it kind of means you haven't decided what it needs to be so i think the general tab should be or the general channel sorry should be largely ignored instead you should create additional channels depending on your requirement so Ultima, we use a number of different models for our, our team, but one of the key ones we use is with our, our project management for our customers. And I think Teams is an excellent solution for that. So inside this particular team example, I've actually got two channels that are hidden, so I'm going to unhide those. Bring them back. We have a number of channels depending on the, 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 the stage that they're at. Now, we, ha we actually have an eight-stage process. I've only included five here just for, for demo purposes, but we have a different channel depending on the, the stage at which you're, you're at the project. And it's very common for, for many large projects that I might have brought in for stages one to four, and then a different, a different consultant or a different architect might be brought in for the latter stages, or, or I may be involved in stages one to eight. It, it helps to break up the information that's, that's inside this, this team, inside this project. And again, because the chat is persistent, if I look at the deployment, or the discovery phase of this project, I can see there's a large conversation going on between the uh, the team. It's persistent again, so if I was to bring in somebody into this team as at this point, they'd be able to see all of the previous conversation up to that point. You'll also be able to see a number of tabs that we've created. So when you first create a team or create a channel, you get given three tabs out of the box. The post one is for the conversation. This is very similar to, to the chat, but there are some subtle differences. So Again, using the email analogy, if I start a conversation here, I'm sending, I'm broadcasting to everyone via the CC column, unless I want to call somebody out directly. 
So you use what they call an app mention, which isn't working because my keyboard's US. If I use an app mention to Arthur, and then I say, um, do you have the file? So this is Anne writing a message to Arthur. Then Arthur will get a notification on his screen on his activity feed that Anne's mentioned him. And here is the file, or here's the item inside the B that's been highlighted. It's now disappeared. The colors changed because I've now read it. This is giving an example of what it can look like. Um, but if you use an app mention, it is calling someone's attention, i.e. putting a name in the two box, you're expecting a response. They can then respond in line and you can have a conversation. Other people can chime in and join into the conversation and you can choose at that point whether to take it into a private conversation if you need be. But again, you can also share files in here. Now this is a different, a slightly different interface to the, the chat in that you can share files from your OneDrive, but also you can bring in files that are, exist already inside the team or inside a particular channel. This should be used with some caution, however, in that if you are an owner of a particular team, it is possible to, to bring files in to a team or a channel from another team that perhaps you didn't need to share or didn't want to share with them. That's always worth using with some caution. But for general use case scenarios, I think it's a fantastic way of ensuring the content you've stored inside the team, inside SharePoint, is visible within the team and can be then collaborated on by the colleagues. Instead of linking to a file share or a traditional other storage area that's away from SharePoint. So I can add in items from a team and a particular channel if I want to through here. I can dive up and jump around a number of teams different. You see each of these folders represents a different channel, different stage of the project in my example, and I can choose to add files in. Again, the same items appear here as with the, the chat. There is some additional fields available here for the text editor. So this is very similar as before, that this code snippet is available from, from the chat, but there's also these additional options here. So I can choose to make it a conversation where I'm expecting a response. I can actually make it an announcement instead. So I don't actually want anyone to respond. I'm just, I'm just here's an announcement and I can then lock off who can, re who can reply. Moderators in this context is an owner. So anyone that's an owner of a team is considered a moderator. So as with most, intranet deployments you want a very small number of owners and a very large number of consumers in this case most of your members of a team should be members and not owners just to avoid any unnecessary admin overhead and also i can choose whether to post this to multiple channels this is quite an efficient way of doing things you may want several or one message to be sent to several channels at the same time i can choose which channel and which team i want to post to so i can select the channel and choose a number of different teams and channels at the same time again use this with caution depending on what you're sending and what you're including because you may have a file included here that you're sharing or you're intending to share with whoever if you then share it to the wrong channel it's possible you might add it or give someone access to it that probably shouldn't have so just bear that in mind when you are sharing and again the other additions are available here as well that were on the chat there is one addition here as well is the, is the meet now which i will discuss in more depth in a minute shortly but you can initiate an, an immediate meeting at this point and then call in people into that chat and to, to have a meeting at this point which is either video or, or audio only there are other tabs in here as well the files tab is linking to the sharepoint site that's attached to this particular team now, all sharepoint does behind the scenes is it creates or it uses the default modern team site and this default uh, documents library and simply creates a folder for each of the channels that you've created and that's how it separates the content there is a lot more you can do with sharepoint which is outside the scope of this webinar but uh Olson will be delivering a, a webinar in, in i think two to three weeks time on how you can use sharepoint to enhance this this uh, experience a lot further so i'd encourage you to look out for that and to join if you can but for most purposes i think the, the default selections here are for, are sufficient for what you want to do with most document management solutions, but you can take it a bit further if you choose to. And certainly as a SharePoint consultant, I would I would certainly recommend you do, mainly for some of the errors which I'll discuss in a couple of weeks. But the files tab here will show me what's available within this, this channel. And there are, are additional tabs in there. What I want to show you here was the the tabs here that I've added to add some additional, I guess, additional flavor to this particular channel. So I've got a, a planner. So Planner is another service in 365, which I've added into this channel. 
I made it available to this particular team and this particular channel. So the idea is if we hold meetings, as you probably do, you generate normally a list of actions. Those actions need to be passed to people and you want those people to deliver on those actions and then you'll, you'll then meet again to then discuss the next steps, next steps as, as, uh, as you go on. Plan is a good way of keeping track of those items and the beauty of Teams, if you're in a meeting, which I'll show you shortly, you could then have the, the planner on the screen as you're working together. You could put the tasks in as you generate them, whoever's capturing the minutes and actually assign them whilst you're in the meeting instead of doing it as, a, as an after or post meeting task. That's just one example. There are others as well. So here I've got that's the one note which I've added in. There's no, there's no content in it, but it's just to show you that you can add a one note again as a, as a tab. This is all about that um, context switching I was talking about before. So instead of switching from Teams to OneNote to Planner in separate browser tabs, I'm using tabs inside the client here. And while I'm working away here, if, uh, if Lee was to have messaged Anne or any activity popped up, it would appear over here so she could see what was going on while she was inside the application. Additional apps I've added here as well is I've actually embedded an Excel sheet directly into this tab, which I think is quite useful. And this shows another useful area of sort of co-collaboration, which is a big benefit of Teams and, and Office 365 in general is that I've got a, an Excel sheet here that I've attached to this channel directly in this team. And, and Lee or Anne is now working inside the file. But if I go in as Lee as well, let me see. goes into the same file Hopefully this isn't the part where the demo pulls over there we go so we get a little notification that leads also in here with a little purple circle up here and it indicates which cell leads currently working on so if I start adding items in here We can see, or Anne can see that Lee is adding things in, into the sheet in real time, and we can collaborate together. Now, if we were in different offices, we weren't talking for whatever reason, or we weren't able to talk at that time, we can actually instigate a conversation whilst we're working on that part as well. And that's all inside the same window. So from here, in the conversation starter, we can see that, again, it's persistent. So this particular file, there's already a conversation going on from yesterday, but we can actually start a new one. So yeah, uh, task six, which we could have, for example. So on Lee's screen, it's popped up. There's activity. I can see that it's telling me there is a change to be made. I've got the conversation open as well, so I can see that the, the messages appear straight away. So as she's suggested, I'll change it, and it's changed in real time. So. And again, this conversation is persistent. So this is visible in here, but if Arthur comes in, pretty sure I'm jumping around a lot here. Arthur comes in, see, Arthur's not looking at the file, he's looking at the conversation, but he can see the same conversation here. So it's related to the same file, and Arthur can see that Lee and Anne are both talking about this file at the same time. And then if Arthur decides to come in, You can do the same thing and, and join in and see he can see what's going on in the file. He can see that it's actually being currently edited and he can, can co-collaborate on the same file as well. So the tabs you can add to a team can be many, many different types. If we hit the plus sign, give you an idea. There's I think there's around 400 at the last check, around 400 different types of apps that you can potentially use in teams. And they, they largely fall into three very broad categories. There's the Microsoft apps, so the ones that are published by Microsoft and connect to a lot of their common services, such as Planner, Power BI, PowerPoint, SharePoint, Stream, the ones you can see on the screen, Word, Excel. They're also then a, a huge group of third party apps for a lot of third party apps that you may use as well. These are um, generally associated with perhaps a, a subscription service or maybe they're free. I, I don't know the particulars on many of these, but there are some standard ones. Trello is a good one that's very common. There's, a, there's an app for that. 
There's also um, uh, Poly. And, um, let me know, there's over 400, so it's far too many to go through. But there are some key ones, I think Box, using external storage, potentially, I don't know if Google Drive has got one. That doesn't, I guess they still don't get on very well, do they? But there are, there's many integration between, between Teams and a number of third parties. And the third type is you can also create your customized apps. So as I was talking about earlier with the, with the cards, there's a huge development community out there for, for Teams customization. And uh, you can develop and deploy your own apps. I would recommend, the first instance, though, that you don't, you don't allow blanket access to apps. So I'd, I'd highly recommend that, if there are any administrators listening, is that you control the apps that are used. So from the Teams admin console, declare which apps you will allow your teams to use and block the ones you don't want them to use. For example, if you don't want them to store files in Google Drive or Box, Google Drive, you can connect to Teams as a, to, uh, as a source of content. So I'd recommend you turn that off because you want to use OneDrive or SharePoint. But rather than allowing users to test it out, I'd, I'd totally recommend that you block that um, and choose which apps you want to allow and then make a decision whether you want to allow customized apps as well. I think customized apps uh, have a huge potential within Teams, but obviously there's, there's also great risk as well. And potentially if you have a, a particular method or, or culture you'd like to, to encourage within the business and using teams, you might want to control what the users actually do and how they want to, to conduct the business around teams. Because teams can easily become effectively what they call content sprawl. When teams first gets deployed, if you don't govern it correctly, it can easily blow up into a very large behemoth and quite difficult to administer. Again, a big area where Ultima can help with, with the governance and the policy side of things and help you to sort of keep control of teams. And that kind of takes us on to the nice easy part about here, how you join or create teams. So if you decide you want to join a team or create, you do it literally with the button down the bottom here. Now, another key admin tip I'd recommend is that the who can create teams should be locked down as well. So we can provide a link to a, an article on Microsoft Docs that allow you to, to, to limit this. I highly recommend you do this again to prevent uh, content sprawl because you don't want large numbers of teams to suddenly appear. The reason this does happen is when you create a team, you can choose a team to be either a, a private or public. If I was to, you can make it a private or public team. And if you make everything private, then team people won't realize those teams exist. And if they don't realize it exists, they might go in and think, oh, there isn't a team for marketing or HR, whatever, I'll go and create one. So you end up with five or six teams all with the same purpose because they didn't realize. Now you can join a team if you're an owner of a team you've already created one you can invite people to join by sending them an invitation or you can generate a code the primary difference between the two is that with a code you're giving the person the option whether they want to join or not so if you generate a code and give them the code if they don't want to join they just don't enter the code and don't join the team if you add them as a member they're in the team whether they like it or not and they're then going to start to get mentions and activity appear in their in their feed perhaps they didn't want to be part of that team but it, it does give the users the option, so there's, there's one or two ways. Um, I'd highly recommend you you consider using public groups only for content that is going to be public. Reason being is that some of the timer jobs that SharePoint does behind the scenes, if you try changing the permissions on some of the areas of SharePoint to make them more secure, the timer jobs will revert them back to read, basically read to everyone in the, in the group. So if you are going to use a public group, use it only for public content. When I say public, I mean for public consumption across the business in general. If you are going to introduce some level of Permission control, then use a private group. And again, if you remove the possibility of creating teams from here and have it controlled through a, a, a workflow, you could do that with Power Apps and a Power Automate using a, a simple form that's, that's held inside SharePoint, for example, where a person can request a team to be created based on a number of parameters. It could then be assessed by an approver, and then an automated process can then go in and actually create that team for you based on your template, based on your look and feel, and based on the different channels and things that you want to establish again it's a good way of ensuring conformity when you uh, start to roll out teams to the larger population now teams can get very busy if you're a member of a number of teams so i actually haven't hidden any teams here but if i decided i didn't want to see this customer documents team as well i could hide the team move it from my view so it is now visible under here but it removes it from the view perhaps it's a team i'm not working with a lot so i can hide it Additionally, I can pin teams as well. So if this is a particular project I'm working on a lot or, or quite 
a lot at the moment. I could pin it. So, um, yeah, I can make it a favorite. And so I used to be able to do that. One of example. That feature will not be available in this tenant, but you can certainly hide uh, teams and channels that you're not interested in looking at. So I could hide this particular one. Well, that's got a pin. Here we go. Which is slow connection. So if I choose to pin it, it will pin it at the top and make it a highlighted item that then is forms part of my favorites. And again, I can choose to, to hire teams if I want to remove them from the, from the workspace. An additional feature that's useful around this as well is with all the noise that goes back and forward, sometimes you may have certain messages that you want to retain that you find that are quite useful. So if you find a message that you want to, to retain, you can highlight the item and choose to save it. And then there are two ways to get to this. You can either go into the command bar and look at your saved items. This is almost like your favorites list in a browser. You can look at items that you've saved. This is very useful for messages you want to keep. Or you can look at it from the, the user menu at the top here and look at the saved item, which actually takes you to the same place. I'm just going to change the context there so you can see it change. That covers the interface. It covers Teams in a fairly broad sense. I'm now going to talk about the calendar. This is, a, again, quite a fairly big part of, of Teams. I think fundamentally a big part of, of how you communicate. So when you're having in, in the chat, you could chat with them in, instantly over Skype or one-to-one -one through the Teams communicator here. You could start a sharing session or a video session, which is effectively a meeting, or you can schedule it through the calendar, which is the same thing. So this calendar here where I open is actually looking at my calendar of my own inbox through my own mail. So I can see it's nice and empty, not many, uh, uh, meetings to, to, to be held in here. I can choose to meet now, which is an immediate meeting. I choose to meet now. I can give it a name. I can choose the audio settings. I'm not going to use the camera. And it's now running at this point. I can invite people who I want to invite. And Anne, it's going to make a call to Anne and she's going to get an instant call. So on Anne's screen, I can see that uh, trying to join them in. I'm not going to use the mic that's going to cause a problem. Anne's joining. We now have Lee and Anne together. And if Lee wants to then share a screen, which is fairly, fairly common for most meeting examples, you can share it using a similar method as before, or you can start collaborating on files immediately together. So if I share I can share the main window, I could then navigate around the team. So if I move into the Teams interface here, what it does is it puts the meeting, the meeting is to running, but it's showing that the screen has been shared with the red box around the outside. I can then move around the team. I can then decide, okay, and we want to work together on the on the Excel sheet we were working on a few minutes ago. And then look at the file itself. I'm getting this clipping around the outside because I'm using a, a VM and I'm sharing the screen through two mediums here. So it's causing a bit of a problem. But then we're in the shared meeting, we're sharing the Teams client, we're then working together on the particular file. We've got a conversation inside the file you saw before. We actually also have a conversation inside the meeting as well. So I want to go back to the meeting here. I can click back into the meeting window down here and I can actually open up the chat that's on this particular meeting as well. And again, this is persistent as well. So this is a once off meeting, but if we were to restart a meeting between the two of us again, it would pick up where it left off with the chat. It would bring in the same information from before. And if I was to bring in a third or fourth person into the conversation at that point, then it would be able to see the persistent thread on the communication as well. Just to end of that meeting there. Okay. I think there are many use case scenarios that I think meetings in Teams can, can address. Certainly, um, Using traditional email, if you if you generate meeting agenda or, or files you want to work with in a meeting, perhaps you currently circulate them via email. Teams allows you to store that file inside Teams and SharePoint, and then share the file within the meeting you're in. You can work together collaboratively at the same time on the file, or you can work on it outside of the meeting. 
think that's a huge benefit. It means that the file that's stored inside SharePoint or OneDrive is the is the single element of truth. It means you get control over the over the versions of the files that you have. It means you don't have disparate versions that are spread around. If you have governance issues or, or retention issues with certain types of files, keeping them inside SharePoint and OneDrive allows you to apply governance and apply retention policies. It also then I think helps to, to, to minimize duplication and to sort of about the element of truth. What is the file that I need to work with? What is the um, what is the correct file? And avoiding that that noise that can potentially occur with with additional email. Um, I'm just gonna switch back to my slides. So I appreciate it was a very whistle stop tour and, and quite a, a fast pace. The team itself is a very very large product, and there are, there's a lot more detail I could go into. And certainly very keen to just discuss with anyone if you want to go into more depth. Really the key then is um, at this point, how can Ultima help a bit further? So we are a, a fast track partner with Microsoft as well. And uh, for any, and this goes back to those three buckets at the very beginning. If you are in the first bucket, you're considering moving to, to biggest five. If you have over 150 seats that are already purchased with Microsoft, then you are eligible for the fast track program, which is, which is free of charge. It allows you professional services through a partner such as Ultima to assess with your onboarding. So there are some lightweight migration scenarios that are supported, allowing you to, to get on board with many of the workloads you can see in front of your teams, obviously being a big part of that. But this is free of charge. It is available to, to all clients over 150 seats that are already purchased. Either you purchase them through us or you purchase them through another provider or direct from Microsoft. If you already have 150 seats, you can request assistance from us to, to assist with the onboarding to, to really get to to get the most value out of business five your, your tenant that's one area that ultima can help with and there are there are others as well so we we offer a full design and planning service as well so um if you're in that third bucket and you've got no cloud service whatsoever and you're interested in moving to the cloud or considering we can help you to design and plan your potential move into the cloud perhaps you're looking at a hybrid scenario where you would like to to put some services in the cloud but remain on premise for many of the others we can certainly help with the design and the planning and also the, the, the deployment as well, if, if need be, but certainly we can help with all, all stages of that and adoption. User adoption is a big piece as well. So change is inevitable, but it's also quite frightening for many people as well. We can help with putting into, into place procedures and, and uh, adoption services that help users adjust to the, to the big change potentially in a, in a massive change. So if you're in that third bucket, again, you've got no, no cloud services of any kind, moving over to a, to a remote working or, or working on a cloud only environment it could be quite a bit of a culture shock. So we can certainly help with improving user adoption. But ultimately, the, the success of the project will be measured on how how the users adopt it, never mind how much efficiency or, or, or perceived cost savings there might be. If the users don't adopt it, then the project could be considered a failure. So we can certainly help with that. Migration services is a big part of what we do as well. So moving content from A to B, but it's not just about lifting and shifting. It's also about do you want to make more or create more value out of the content that you have moved? Can it be restructured? Do you want to apply some governance or some retention or some control over that content? We can certainly help with that. And that all feeds into the design and planning service as well. And then that feeds onto well to the, the governance and the compliance area as well. So we can help with GDPR and, and, and any other kind of compliance policies in a number of different industries. Teams does have full telephony integration. Unfortunately, I don't fully understand or could convey a lot of benefits around it, but it does have full telephony integration as well. So if you do have a, a, a telephony system that can integrate with Teams, we can certainly assist with that as well. But um, that is also an additional service that we can provide. And then the, the final point, I guess, is maybe largely outside of Teams, but um, we can also assist with general network auditing, health check and remediation of generally anything that you may need assistance with. The two email addresses there at the end are if you have any questions you'd like to get in touch, we have we have consultants and sales team standing by to assist. Please send in your queries to any of the addresses below. If you have a licensing query you're interested in in the uh, trial and you'd like to know more about how that can be, uh, be arranged, then please email the licensing team. If you have any general inquiries about how we may be able to assist with our professional services or any of the services that you've seen here, We'd like to know more a bit about uh, any of the areas I've gone through today in more depth because I went through quite quickly. And uh, please get in touch on that. But thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time.
and uh, I'll draw the meeting to a close. I won't hold any questions because there's a large number of attendees, but uh, thank you for your time, thank you for your attention.